where we celebrate, uh, it's part of the national campaign, uh, which is called, uh, yeah, I hate it, and I didn't know you might see it in the film. You know? <laughs> but it's still occasion to my mind for some reason, though, a bit disturbing. Uh, before I go any further, I should point out the important bit uh, is that we've got two fire escapes. One is the way that you came in, and the other is just around the corner there. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, where was assistant? Yeah. The, and the other important thing, particularly important, is we only have one loo. So, uh, so a bit of organisation uh, will be uh, really needed here. Uh, what, the event, what we will do is uh, it's Ben, that's Ben over there, oh, Ben Brooks. Uh, ben will give you a talk about this fantastic fossil which we very rarely have a chance to display, which is called The Beast in the Cellar, named after the 1970s horror film, which I years ago. Uh, and um, also what we're going to do is I've got some uh, activities for the children organised upstairs, uh, including something called the uh, Time Machine Toilet Roll, or the Toilet Roll Time Machine, where we work out how 240 million years of life works with just a toilet roll and some plastic models. It works quite well. If any adults want to do that as well, no, no, listen to Ben. Uh, is there still one in the loop? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I brought it. In fact, I even, I even made sure that I got one of the ones that had 240 segments because that's worth every million years. So if there's less than 240, I should be complaining to Tesco. <laughs> so, uh, so what we'll try and do is keep the noise that people will be upstairs uh, down, as, down as far as possible so we don't disturb them being uh, doing this talk down here. Um, and I should actually thanks some people in advance because this fossil weighs an absolute ton, probably more than that. And this afternoon, Ben and Chris have moved this up from the cellar where it normally lives. Uh, and Emma's helped as well. It's been a, a gargantuan task and it probably breaks every health and safety rule in the book. And bear in mind that Ben, Chris, Alex and I went on the first aid course yesterday. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, so far, we've not needed it. But, but anyway. It, 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 an absolutely stupendous task of moving it up. Some of these bits are colossally heavy. So, thanks, lads, for that. I also need to thank uh, Heather of, of, of Fancy That Cakes, who've made us, who's made us that absolutely fantastic Ammonite cake, which you all get to enjoy at half time. Uh, and uh, she's based in Benminster. And can I, I've never met the lady before, but if you need a cake, go to her because she did that for us for free. So, uh, <laughs> and there's some cards there for us as well. So. Please take all of my guys if you want a cake made. Uh, you know, that's the least we can do for uh, Of course, uh, what we're also here to celebrate and what the cake is for is that it's Mary Anning's 214th birthday. We invited her, but she stood us up. Uh, so, uh, so that's really what the cake is to celebrate. Uh, so I think without any further ado, we should. Oh, sorry, I should also say that the, the form of the night is Ben will do his talk, then we'll have a break and have a. a Cake and a drink, and then, and then in smaller groups or or in a less formal setting, we can go upstairs, and Paddy and Chris will explain the story behind our fantastic new ichthyosaur skull, the uh, which we call a line by ichthyosaur, which is well, well you, those of you who have seen it will know what it's like, and those of you who haven't seen it should be amazed by the size of it. And what I might suggest doing is that if if in the second half you don't want to stand up for too long, by all means take one of these chairs upstairs with you. They're quite light, so. Uh, don't bother that. So, that's the form of the night. Uh, hopefully, we should go on to about nine o'clock. Who knows? Maybe longer. So, if I could, if I could, if I could, could call on Ben, I think you'll have to come this way first. Uh, oh, oh, good thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. trying to go on the Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ben does a huge amount of work for us. He's, uh, he's got a degree and uh, added masters in the subject, as it says up there. Uh, and he went to Southampton University and uh, he'll be starting on the Museum Studies course uh, at Leicester University very soon. And uh, have you started? He's starting? Yeah, he's starting. He's a correspondent from the district learning. Uh, and I'm sure he'll be doing do incredibly well because one thing that I've discovered working, for him for uh, working with him for the last few months is that uh, he's a fantastic geologist, incredibly hard working. And I'm embarrassed. Over to you, Ben. Thanks. So you saw me down the river now. Yeah. Okay, so. Sorry, Ben. Can I just take the children upstairs? Yeah.
do the activities. Right. Now, if anyone wants to move forward, there are three chairs now. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple, yeah, couple on this other thing. We want to move sort of sideways or... I'll oh, come to the front as well. Oh, okay, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as always has been said, my name is Ben. I'm an independent geologist. And I need to give a bit of thanks to a chap called Phil Davidson, who's in uh, Russia at the moment. Uh, he's the geologist at Charles Heritage Coast Centre, and he uh, was very helpful with me when we uh, assessed this specimen about uh, two, three months ago. He came into the museum uh, to assess it for things like pyro decay and, and it's uh, just what we had as a museum in the room. Um, so, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about tonight is the Jurassic Coast, very briefly, run through why this is a heritage site and um, what we have along this piece of coastline. I'm also going to talk about ichthyosaurs, obviously, what they were, uh, and uh, uh, about, a little bit about their evolution and where they come from and things like that. I'm also going to talk a fair bit about uh, convergent evolution, that's this thing here, because ichthyosaurs in general, and this one in particular, show us some wonderful things uh, compared to modern day creatures that tell us a little bit about evolution as a, as a concept. So, this is a little animation I, I stole from the uh, Jurassic Heritage Coast team, and it just tells you a little bit about what's happened here. So we've had the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous rocks have been laid down over, you know, 100, 150 million years or, or so, uh, 185 million years, uh, and they've been tilted over time, been tilted by continental drift, uh, plate tectonics, the creation of mountains and things like that, and then. Uh, on top of that, further rocks have been deposited after it's been eroded away. So it's been tilted. If you imagine everything's been tilted towards Portland Bill, so over into that direction. And it's been tilted that way. It's been sunk under the sea for a, a few million years or so. It's been eroded away, so you've cut through all these layers of rock that are now uh, doing that. You've cut through all those layers of rock. And, you, and then after that, it's been sunk under the sea again. A new layer of rock has been deposited on top of that, uh, which on this diagram is the green rock, and that's everything from 265 million years ago till now. And then further to that, that's been lifted up again, and it's been eroded away, giving us the coastline that we see today. Uh, and so at the far, far end of this diagram, that's where Sidmouth is, and that's the place where if you go there, you see bright red cliffs, uh, that's the, the Triassic rocks, uh, the environment at the time of the Triassic was uh, sort of an arid, not quite a desert environment, but very, very close to it. As you move along the coast, you go through 95 miles of coastline, takes you through all 185 million years of those three time periods. So you, you get to see the entire Mesozoic period of that 95 miles, which is the main drive behind this part of the coastline being a heritage coast and uh, world heritage site. As we move along, at the far end, so that's Sigma, this end we have Swanage, and at, this, at that end of the coastline we have Lake Cretaceous rocks, and you can find all sorts of wonderful things there. So there's chalks, you can find turtles, and all sorts. So this, this is going to just give you some idea of whereabouts in the world we are. Obviously, you know where we are now, we're in the south coast of England, my Regis and Dorset. If I press this button, hopefully some magic will happen. And we'll see all the continents reverse their uh, movements, and we'll see us go back to the early Jurassic. But that's probably my football than yours. Um, and you see, it's just about where my Regis is here, in the middle of the Tethys Ocean. Sea people like it at the time, so it's called Ocean. Um, as a shallow sea, shallow sea environment. With lots, lots of creatures. So if you imagine sort of the Bay of Biscay or the Mediterranean Sea, not very deep, but with lots and lots of wildlife. Um, you see, you should be able to make out some of the continents there. You've got that's South America, just in the way there. You've got Africa, India's this little bit here, Antarctica and Australia. 
This is a bit more of a mess. I couldn't tell you which was which apart from you can just see this top bit. That's the Caledonian Mountains, so that's Norway there. So setting the scene then, I've told you it's a, uh, it's a, um, a shallow sea environment, and that's reflected in the geology here. We've got layers of rock in the cliffs. If you, who, who's been out on the beach recently? Who's been out on the beach at all? I know you have, man. You're out on the beach every darn day. Um, so you've got layers of rock in the cliffs. All of the rocks here, with uh, the, the exception of the flint in the, in the Cretaceous rocks on top of the cliffs, all of the rocks here are limestones. So they're, they're formed under the sea. And we get two types of limestone here. We get really hard uh, calcified limestone, so the sort of thing you've got buildings out of. And if you look around the town, you'll see many of the buildings here, of, or many of the oldest buildings here, are built with local limestone rock. And you'll also see, if you go out on the beach, you'll see layers of mudstone and shale. So really fissile, essentially still mud. It hasn't really solidified into a really hard rock. Um, Anybody, any ideas why we have those banded layers? It's not a trick question, I don't expect you to know. Any ideas? Okay. It's called... Yes, Paddy, I know you. That's <laughs> <laughs> why you never have geologists in the room when you're giving a talk. <laughs> so the reason we get these layers in the rock, it's all to do with climate change. Now, we're not talking the sort of thing you see on the news nowadays. We're not talking... Um, uh, climate change, climate change, we're not talking anything quite anywhere near as rapid, so 200 years wouldn't, uh, of change wouldn't be reflected in the geological record. What we've got, if you imagine you have layer, a layer of mudstone and a layer of limestone on top, that represents something like 40,000 years. Um, and it's all to do with the changes in the Earth's orbit. Now, the geological name for it is Milankovitch cyclicity. And basically, if you imagine that's the sun, the Earth orbits around quite happily, but over the course of 40 to 100,000 years, its orbit changes. The most obvious of these changes is a change in the elliptic of the orbit. So, if that's the Sun, it starts off being very circular, but over time it becomes more and more elliptical, and then goes back again. And that produces changes in the Earth's climate. Most predominantly, a change in solar radiation, which lowers or lightens the temperature depending on which way you're going. So if you're coming back towards a more circular orbit, you get more solar radiation, more heat, and that, that engenders more sort of sea life to survive very well. So you get, uh, anyone come across algal blooms? Yeah. It's that sort of thing. You get blooms of sea creatures out in the sea, little tiny diatoms and forearms. And um, when they die, their shells survive very well, fall to the sea floor, and that gives you these layers of, of really hard limestone. And then when the orbit becomes more elliptical, you get a more changeable uh, climate. So you get colder winters, warmer summers, which gives you more erosion on land. And that puts lots and lots of sediment into the sea, which essentially it swamps all of those diatoms. So they're still raining down to the sea floor, creating rock, but there's much more of the sediment. So it, it swamps it, so you don't see it so easily. That's what gives us um, those layers in the cliff. And then 200 years ago, uh, give or take, when Mary Ellen was out and about <coughs> uh, looking for ichthyosaurs sorts of plesiosaurs and things like that, the rocks here were quarried. Does anyone know anything about the quarrying industry here? Up to Chris, yes, I know you know. Well, 200, 200 years ago, they used to quarry the local cliffs. I said some of the local buildings are built out of this hard limestone. That's where they got it from. This is a view of Church Cliffs, so that's on the um, east side of the line. And you can see this, this is the sea wall, and then there's a little embayment back there. And all of this was quarried 200 years ago. And that sea wall had to be put in in about 1911, I think it was. Anyone any ideas why they had to put it in? There's a clue in the name of the cliffs, the Church, Church Cliffs. Yeah, the churchyard was falling down. Exactly right, the churchyard was falling into the sea. Why is that a problem? <laughs> yeah. You used to find bones on the beach, but they weren't necessarily fossil bones. You'd find your relatives, and um, I believe the museum has a photograph or a postcard from the time, and you can see it's got a view of church cliffs and lots of little white dots. And uh, people writing at the time said that they were finding bits of skull and jewel and all sorts of other bits and bobs on the beach. 
not necessarily what you'd, uh, you'd like to see at a seaside town these days, but 200 years ago, that's what you'd find. Okay, so that sets the scene. Brits, shallow, sharp sea environment. These are empty sores. I'm sure anybody who's come tonight knows what empty looks like. So it looks a bit. Anyone tell me what that looks like? Shark. Dolphin. Shark is a good answer. Dolphin is far better. They look a lot like a modern dolphin, and we'll come on to that a bit later when I start talking about convergent evolution. But we've got ichthyosaurs, we've also got plesiosaurs. Now, we're celebrating Mary Anning's, what was it? 214. 214th birthday. Thank you. I forgot that. Um, and Mary Anning is supposed to have found the first ichthyosaur. That's not strictly true. Her brother found the first one, or the first one scientifically described, and she went, she, he found the skull. She went and collected the rest of it after he told her where it was. But she did find the first plesiosaur. So there's the long necked long -neck marine reptiles with the four big paddles. And she also found other things here. There's um, uh, Scalatosaurus, which is a dinosaur. What was a dinosaur doing here? Any ideas? Technically speaking, yes. Washed down. Yeah. Washed down. Drowned. They were washed into the sea, probably by a flash flood. If anyone's seen wildebeest try and cross a river in flood, they do that regularly every year. Some of them get washed, washed away and they get washed into the sea, and that's what we think happened to the spinosaurus. But in terms of the local environment, you've got the ichthyosaurs, top predator. You might have thought sharks might be the top predator, but most of the local sharks have really domed teeth. So they're designed not for biting into fish or ichthyosaurs or other sharks, they're designed for crushing. So they're crushing things like um, bivalves and brachiopods living either on uh, reefs on the sea floor or on uh, bits of driftwood. Um, but if it's all top predator, um, I don't think you'd want to leave one on a dark night, let's put it that way. Especially when you come to the front and you see the size of this one. Okay, so the story of this particular specimen. Uh, we don't actually know very much because somewhere in the midst of time, all the documentation that went with this specimen has disappeared. It's probably somewhere in a filing cabinet in the museum. We haven't found it yet. Um, but what we do know from, uh, I'm going to use hearsay, I think is probably the best way of describing it. We know that it was excavated over 100 years ago. Uh, we don't know exactly when. It was collected by a Mr. Henry Ellis and was donated by, them to, by uh, a Miss Ruttill in 1927 to the museum. Uh, when, it was, when it was found, there is um, uh, more hearsay about it. First of all, that it was found while quarrying, said the quarrying was going on. And um, I think Chris was talking to us about quarrying earlier to some people. The, the big quarry owners would have been very happy that their quarry had found one of these beasties, because they could sell that for a lot of money to someone like Henry Delabesh or William Buckland, who was studying them at the time. Um, there's also a story that, some, that uh, when it was found, somebody carved an eye into the, into the, uh, the stone of the skull. Um, completely anatomically incorrect, as we'll find out in a minute. But they did that in order to make it look more lifelike for the people who were looking at it. Uh, the reason that's not anatomically correct, that's actually the bottom of the skull. So those are the jaw bones. And those two bones, one there, one there, are called hyoid bones and they hold the tongue in place. They're very rare on specimens, so it's really nice that we have that on this particular one. Um, on the other side, I don't think you can actually see any of the top of the skull, so presumably that was eroded out or lost in the quarrying process. Um, and finally, this was prepared again, and a cast was produced in 1985 by one of the local fossil collectors called David Austin. And when you go up to the Georgia Gallery, if you go in, you turn around and you look up, you will see a wonderful cast of this specimen. Now the reason we've got this one out on display and we've uh, uh, and not the cast, the cast is up on the wall and it's a lot lighter than this specimen, as uh, David intoned earlier. But also, this specimen has some other, other features that you can't see on the cast, which I'll talk about in a minute. In terms of what, what we've got, we've got about 70% of the creature, so all of the bits I've Coloured in red on that particular ichthyosaur, with one exception, we don't have those pelvic bones. But a bit too much fat on coral draw to get it to work, so I left them. Um, 
But that's basically all of what we've got here in this specimen. So, we do have some special preservation on this. <coughs> this special preservation is very rare, and what it gives us is soft body parts or things that we wouldn't normally expect to see. Now, myself and Phil, when we were examining the specimen, we are a bit dubious that this is special preservation. It could be uh, mineralization of a different kind. It could be some other mineral. We don't know. We're, we're not experts in soft body parts. But all of the parts are shaded in green, so these three, and um, this one, possibly, that, that's very dubious, have a sort of a funny blackish grey film, and when you get to have a look at it, you'll see that. Now that could be soft body preservation, that could be a bacterial film, and um, I think on one of the slides later on, I'll show you a special <coughs> holes party, which has a wonderful bacterial film impression, and that's where, uh, when the animal's been lying on the seat or rotting, uh, the bacteria have eaten away at the soft parts, but they leave behind this uh, tracery of the body. Uh, I've got it later on because it shows something quite interesting. Uh, the other special preservation we have, there is this, which it actually looks a lot better on there than it does on the specimen. Um, just down here, really about this big, there is a piece of a fossil fish preserved inside the specimen. This could be two things. This could this be something that the animal's eaten? Probably not. Uh, it's probably been washed in after the animal's died, uh, after it's started rotting. Or it might, might even have gone in inside, went with rotting to try and get a free meal and then died inside the animal. Don't know, we can't tell. Probably isn't something the animal ate for a start. Fish, when they are, uh, when they wash, when you find those fossils, you very rarely find them as articulated specimens because they're, they're made of very small bones very small scales, so it doesn't take much of a current to disperse them, and you can imagine if you've eaten the fish, its scales are going to be even less likely to be preserved fully intact. So, we do have that, don't, as I say, we don't think it's something that the animal will eat but it is interesting to see nonetheless, and uh, after the talk, if you want to have a close look, I do have a hand lens, so you can get down to the floor and have a look at it and see if you can make out the scales. And if I click on, should just be able to make them out. Each of those is an individual scale. So that could be part of the flank of the fish, or could be a piece of fin. As I say, we don't know. I'm certainly no fish expert. So, now on to the conversion of evolution bit. Uh, <coughs> so this is a bit behind not so good at because I'm not a zoologist, but we'll see how it goes. So, conversion of evolution can be governed by one of two main things, really. First of all, the basal body plan. So, you're a human, hopefully, you're a vertebrate, and all vertebrates have the same basal body plan. You'll all have all seen the pictures in the books of the arm of a human, the arm of a bat, the arm of a whale, and all of the lines connecting up. Every single one has the same, same plan for the, the arm. One bone, two bones, many bones. Um, and that can play an important part in conversion evolution because if you're trying, for example, to create a fin or a paddle, you're working with the same same bones. If you're a reverse book, for example, so you're likely to produce the same sort of shape, the same sort of thing at the end of the day. It can also be to do with what you do, so your mode of life, what you do from day to day. If you're eating fish, for example, in the sea, you're probably going to evolve the same features because those features will be the best features for catching fish. If you're doing something else like the sharks crunching uh, bivalves or brachiopods, you're going to evolve similar features because again, that's the best thing for what you're doing. So examples of that, feeding, your jaws, your claw claws and teeth might all evolve in a similar way. So all herbivores have crushing teeth, all uh, predators have uh, sharp biting teeth. Locomotion, legs, fins, and shape, especially with things like ichthyosaurs and dolphins, the shape is very similar because they're trying to do the same job. So they have to do, they have to streamline themselves, which we'll come up to in a minute. And uh, as I was saying about the um, things like the arm, if you've got the same base or body plan, if you're trying to do the same thing with that body plan, you're likely to produce the same thing. And mating rituals. Lots of creatures have antlers and horns, 
They're all competing. That's a good way of doing it. Okay, so streamlining. Those are, those are ichthyosaurs up in the top left. Well, that's what we think they look like. There's good evidence for this, and we'll see in a minute. But you can see this is a tuna, that's a swordfish, and that's a dolphin. All have essentially the same shape because all three of those are predatory animals. They're going after smaller fish, um, so they need to be fast, and they need to be able to uh, get through the water quickly. So they're going to streamline themselves into the best possible shape. Um, so that's one example of the convergent evolution that we see with ichthyosaurs. And there's the Holzmalden specimen. So you can see that bacterial film has given us the shape of the tail fin and the shape of the dorsal fin. Sorry, the um, dorsal fin, tail fin. Um, <clears throat> and that's how we know that those that the ichthyosaurs had those, because there aren't soft parts. The local specimens, as far as I'm aware, none of them have any indication of a dorsal fin or the tail fin beyond the bend at the back of the, the vertical column. So <clears throat> that's how we know that the ichthyosaurs were that sort of shape. Uh, moving on to the jaws then, the animals, uh, the jaws of the animal are quite thin and quite long. Any ideas why that might be? Anyone? Streamlining, sorry? Sleeping Not sleeping over wide, but it is to do with when they open and close. If you've got a big, wide jaw like a crocodile, and you, you open your mouth, and then try to close it underwater, you've got to push all of that water out of the way before you can close your jaws. And that's going to slow you down. If you've got a nice long snout, nice and thin, you can cut through that water a lot quicker, and you can catch the fish. If you're trying to catch the, th the fish and they feel the current, they're going to swim. So you want to cut through that water as quickly as possible to be able to catch them. And so examples of the same thing today, that's an Indian gallium. It's a type of, type of crocodile, uh, or crocodile fall. And it's got a very thin, slender snout, very long, so it can cut through the water and bite down on its prey very quickly. Same thing with the common dolphin. That's a dolphin lower jaw. It's very long, very thin, and filled with sharp teeth. Um, moving on to the teeth of the ichthyosaurs, uh, the smaller ichthyosaurs have very peg like teeth. The larger ones, like this example, but this one doesn't show it, have uh, peg like teeth, but they also have razor sharp teeth, like those you might see, similar to those sort of steak knife type things you see in a tyrannosaurus, much bulkier. Um, and that just allows them to crunch down on their prey much more easily. Next thing is the tail fins. Uh, the three animals we have here, that's a shark at the top, that's a megalodon, that's a, an Eocene shark, so only a 50 million years old, not, not as old as the stuff we have here. Uh, the second one down, that's a mosasaur, uh, that's another type of marine reptile from, I think, Cretaceous, this particular one, and um, the bottom one is an ichthyosaur, that's a Stenopterygis, not that that matters too much, they all mostly the same. And you'll see with the bottom two, the tail bends down to produce that fin shape and to give some strength to the fin when it's moving through the water. With the shark, it goes up. I don't know why that is. I don't know why it goes up rather than down. I suspect it's because the tail of the shark has never, it's, it's not an animal that's gone to land and come back, so it's never had to support any weight, so it hasn't had to be, it hasn't developed a droop. I don't know. That's speculation completely. I don't know if that's the case or not. But you can see that's convergent evolution again. Anyway, know why there isn't a dolphin up there? Dolphin's tails the way around. Dolphin's tails the way around. Do you know why? No. Well, it's it's also with that basal body plan thing I was talking about. Now this is divergent rather than convergent evolution. It's just the same thing, but it's gone different ways. Because reptiles, when they move, if you've ever had a lizard or a snake, they move from side to side. So. Well, it's natural movement from side to side, so it makes sense to have a tail that does this. But with, um, with mammals, when we move, well, not us, but four-legged mammals move, they move more like that. You don't see a dog running or a horse running, they sort of do that more or less. So 
when whales evolve, they, it makes more sense to have their tails like that, and that's why they don't have this droop because you can't split the spinal column in two to do that. So they don't have that? I don't think so. I may yet be wrong. I don't think so. Okay, paddles. Now, to correct myself, as I pointed out earlier, they're not paddles on an ichthyosaur, they are fins because they are not used for paddling. See here, this is a seal, common dolphin, and an early ichthyosaur. So much older than the one we have here. This one's a uh, Triassic ichthyosaur, I think from Switzerland. And you can see, again, basal vertebra body plan using the arm produced the same sort of shape, the same sort of uh, changes in the bones to produce um, a fin. Um, and here's, here's some ichthyosaur specimens. <coughs> the middle two on this side are actually the two that you'll see, or two of the four that you'll see down here. Um, I've got these up here to show you. They're actually we haven't got the whole of the fins. You'll see there's maybe 30 bones in that paddle. That's a smaller species. That, that one's the fin on this specimen here. You see there's an awful lot of bones in that specimen. Um, down here, this is a diagrammatic representation of what this animal's fin should look like. And you'll see we're missing sort of this end portion here on both of those specimens. And you get to see that thing. It's clear to come up have a look. So, in summary, Jurassic dor dorset represents a shallow self shelf sea environment. Um, so we're talking again the uh, Mediterranean Sea, the Bay of Biscay, something like that environment. Lots and lots of animals, really quite rich and diverse. Ichthyosaurs are highly evolved creatures. They've come off the land as lizards, they've come into the sea, and they've developed all these highly evolved traits to allow them to catch the fish and do their, do their best to survive. And convergent evolution in ichthyosaurs and modern animals, so comparing them to dolphins and gallials with the long snout and things like that, allows us to make some logical assumptions about their lives and how they lived. As I say, they're after fish in the sea. We know that because of the slender jaw. We know they're fast because they've, they've got these highly adaptive fins and the big tail flukes, that sort of thing. That's me You're done, I'm afraid. Um, are there any questions? Uh, it doesn't have to be on any this As um, David did great joy putting out my geologist anyway, so any questions at all? Why can't they have to be on display? Why are they casting? I know it's heavy. It's very heavy. Can it be anywhere on the floor and you can look at it or something? Um, um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I believe it was on display at one point. I think it was upstairs lying out. Uh, I don't know if it was in a case or on the floor. Um, the reason it's not on display now, it is the weight. There's not enough room to put it lying out like this. It's very cramped at the moment. Um, and in order to have it properly displayed, ideally you wouldn't be able to walk all the way around it. There just isn't the space to have it anywhere out. And it's far too heavy to mount on the wall, especially in the buildings as old as this one. Although I should say that if we do get an extension at the end, then there might be space. That is the plan. Collecting bucket on the way out. Collect well, well now, now you come to mention it. <laughs> Did you say that it's actually found on the leprosy? That's the hearsay. Um, again, we don't have any documentation regarding which side of the town it came from. It could have been Monmouth. I think it was rumoured to come from Broad Ledge. So, so that, that Broad, Broad, Ledge, Broad Ledge, just just to the east of the town. I mean, that must have been absolutely. Can you, can you imagine finding or bits or something like that? That must have been absolutely wonderful. I, I can't because I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the two gentlemen yeah. back, yeah. who will be talking to you later, have found many, many yes, things of yeah, that's absolutely going on. I would love to find even, even a smaller one than that, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, they've done that. What, what you could say possibly about it, it's all, none of it's weather worn or anything like that. Yeah. So it, it probably hasn't come down the cliff in bits and been found because if they come down the cliff they tend to break up. Yeah. 
if the enforcer had come down over a period of time, you miss bits. That's been either quarried out when they were doing the quarrying, or it's been on a ledge and there's just been a bit showing and they've dug down to it. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it must have come out that way in some way. Any other questions? Are there any theories why there were so many planets in the fields? Bones in the fields? Well, what the fields have done, they've, um, I didn't put a Cretaceous one up, I probably should have done, but what they've done is uh, they've Increase the number of digits. So instead of five, they've got six, seven, up to I think ten uh, in the, the late Cretaceous. Keep going up. And more than ten. More than ten. In the late Cretaceous ones. And then what we've also done is increase the number of phalanxes. Uh, yeah. Um, with the earlier ones, so the Triassic ones and the Jurassic ones, they are quite rigid. Um, so you, more flexibility you don't get more flexibility. You don't get very much flexibility. Probably there is some nice stuff that I don't know what. Having a broader, longer, flatter paddle fin um, actually makes turning and braking easier because you've got more surface area on the fin, less effort to actually. But the, the later Cretaceous ones actually you lose a lot of that rigidity. They end up basically with a, a, a fin that's just full of very rounded bones, so there would be more flexibility as they maybe as they adapted to be more comfortable. Any other questions? Okay. Right, in that case then, I think it's breaking for drinks and cake. <laughs> <laughs>